this week on Today in Space. It's the first week of October. Fall is here. The leaves are changing here in New England, and we've got a lot of space to catch up on. Let's dive in. First on our list for October is that Crew-9 has finally taken flight and docked with the space station. And the reason you might be wondering why is Crew-9 important? Well, remember all summer when the Boeing Starliner drama was consuming everything, the two crew members, Butch Wilmore, Suni Williams, they now have the SpaceX Crew-9 Dragon capsule Freedom with two spare seats to bring them home in February of 2025. So while it was never true that those two astronauts were actually stranded, we did a whole episode about this, a few episodes about this, they were never actually stranded, but now they're definitely not stranded anymore because the backup spacecraft, the Crew Dragon, is there to bring them back. It was a great showing of what the commercial crew program was built for, which is that if there was any worry about, could this fail? Are we putting people at risk? There could be another spacecraft. So it's really cool so early on that we're able to use this key feature of the commercial crew program, right? Having two spacecraft, two different spacecraft from two two different providers that could be, that one could be used as a backup in case anything was wrong. It's just so cool to see that kind of option available in the space industry. And if you want to learn more, you can check out our previous episodes where we dove all into that. And Boeing is now ready to, they've successfully landed the uncrewed Starliner. They're going to work on prepping the next one for the next test flight and see if they're able to complete it. And then we'll have two U.S. spacecraft certified to fly humans which was the whole genesis of the commercial crew program. So, a big day, Crew 9 for the win. In astronomy news for October, we have a visible comet here, folks, as it's going around the sun. Comet Chuchinshan Atlas is here, and it's primed to be a very bright spot in our sky, and you should be able to see it with your bare eyesight. Let's dig into it and talk a little bit more about where to look and how it was discovered. The comet was discovered very recently, January 9th, 2023, at the Purple Mountain Observatory in Chuchinshan in China, and was originally believed to be an asteroid before they saw it getting a tail on February 22nd of 2023, and so they changed its classification to a comet. The comet is getting brighter with every day as it's at perihelion, its closest approach to the sun. The Southern Hemisphere has been able to have this comet in the sky during night hours, and us here in the Northern Hemisphere will have our shot coming up now. And right now, because of how close the comet is to the sun, basically I'm looking for a 15-minute window about 5 degrees above the horizon right before the sun rises where the comet's tail should be seen. Now, I don't know if I'm going to be able to see this. I'm looking in the northeast for this. But as the season goes forward here, you know, in November, the beginning of November is another great opportunity for this comet. So leading up to when the comet goes behind the sun and afterwards, we'll be taking a look at this comet and trying to grab a peek of it ourselves. But it's not going to get much better as far as timing in the sky for about another month. But make sure to look out for it. And if you do see it, first soak it up and enjoy it. And if you happen to take a picture, we'd love to share it here. We'd love to see it. So hit us up on social media, Today in Space Pod, on Instagram and Twitter, Today in Space on TikTok, Today in Space Podcast at gmail.com, and of course on Facebook at Today in Space Podcast. I've still yet to see a comet in our Vespera telescope. So we are 
definitely itching to get that checked off our bucket list of things to observe with a telescope. So if we have the opportunity, you better know we'll take advantage of it. And astronaut friend of the podcast, Don Pettit, has launched and docked to the International Space Station for some time now, and he's already at work with cameras taking some beautiful pictures, and he's been taking pictures and tracking Comet A3 and is already reporting that it's getting brighter. So there's more and more chances for us to be able to see it here down on Earth in the southern and soon to be northern hemispheres. Next up, we got to talk SpaceX, Starlinks, and Starship. First, SpaceX is currently deploying, and Elon Musk is deploying Starlink satellites to the areas of the U.S. that are experiencing Hurricane Helene. It's helping people get access and communication up and running quickly. I have seen plenty of stories at this point of friends or uh, friends of families who are sharing the stories of people who are essentially stranded, damaged to the area, basically making it so that there's not going to be any food or help for about a week. And so right now what SpaceX is doing is deploying these and offering free service and access to this in some areas so that people can do this. And that's been the story of Starlink, this global inter internet satellite constellation that in some ways has ruined some amateur astronomy, but in many ways is doing what the biggest technology leaps have done for humanity, just like telephone lines. It's helping people gain access to the internet, which is communication, which is also information and location with GPS. And to think about these folks who are now seeing what Starlink can do in the U.S. here, the government is deploying them with FEMA. I mean, it's really a story of space being used to solve problems here on Earth. And the story with Starlink has been just beautiful, in my opinion, and, and just a great example of how space technology can help solve problems today for tomorrow's progress on the moon and Mars and beyond. So definitely take note of this if you're interested in business or space or just how things progress in space right now. Starlink is very much disrupting the entire industry and providing something to the everyday human being in ways that we don't really see space do. So a really interesting time we live in here as we move to Starship. And if you guys uh, have not been following, S Starship has been assembled and stacked on the pad in Boca Chica. And now the FAA is going through its process to give SpaceX the green light to launch. Now, SpaceX is trying to land the Starship heavy booster back on the launch pad. And then the arms, the chopsticks of the launch pad would be catching that Starship by the grid fins as it comes in to land where it took off. Now, that is obviously a big step. It would be the fifth test flight of Starship and a huge leap if they're able to do this. They, we saw in the last test where they were able to soft touch on the ocean. So we know they're able to do it. We saw how fast things moved when SpaceX first landed their Falcon 9 rocket. But we are talking about essentially a giant mass that can explode that is going to be landing back on the ground. The big story, though, to follow, if you haven't been following, is the fact that the FAA has a major delay and has had, in some cases, issues with the way that SpaceX is going about their progress. Now, if we talk about the best times in the space industry where we've experienced the most progress, it is the early days, the Apollo program, Mercury, Gemini, they were able to test and progress as fast as they were able to. And we've reached this point where this company, SpaceX, is moving faster than the process that the FAA has in place. And so you'll find many opinions online. Our opinion here is that 
uh, we're not fans of bureaucracy for bureaucracy's sake. And we know there are plenty of things that can get more efficient while also realizing that even with the most fast moving forward, progressive government program, how fast SpaceX has lurched forward the entire space industry with their Starship and reusable rocket technology is faster than anyone else was ready to move. So in a lot of ways, this is SpaceX being, as we just said with Starlink, another disruptor. And I am definitely pro making it easier and easier for SpaceX to launch Starship to develop this technology. But that also goes for Blue Origin and all these other companies, Rocket Lab, that are developing relativity space, like their own rocket technology. We need to get to a place where we're able to take the right precautions, make sure that everyone's doing that, but also go as fast as possible in that process. And I think there's a lot of um, shoving and elbowing right now going on between SpaceX and the FAA. Um, some people not happy with the way that SpaceX does things and SpaceX not happy with the way some of the FAA does things. So we will see how that turns out. But it's definitely delaying things. And, you know, SpaceX also, you know, recently had a second stage anomaly where it was supposed to, a second stage rocket after it delivered the payload, for Crew-9 was supposed to land in a certain area, and it landed outside of that zone. So they're grounded at the moment until that gets fixed. Um, but that's the process. And the last time SpaceX had an issue, they went through that process with the FAA very quickly. So it will take reps. It will, you know, Starship is pushing the FAA process to the max. And they'll get there. I think they've worked well together over the years, and they will continue to do so. We'll just see how far the, um, the the quabbling goes back and forth and how much of the quabbling delays us actually making it to Mars, which is what SpaceX wants to do. They want to be able to launch five starships at the same time and do five test landings because you only get a shot at Mars every two years. So the next window that happens for Mars They'll be sending five starships, or at least that's the plan. And that's a great way to get as many tests as possible in one launch window. And they could totally do it. I wonder what that conversation looks like from NASA and everyone else's perspective of, and the space community's perspective about where do they launch these? And then how do you plan on the launch site in the case that it fails, you know? As you look at Mars as a destination and, and as we go there more often, this is the same with the moon as well. We're going to start picking places that we're going to land continuously. We need to think about that ahead of time and not let it get out of hand because the last thing we want to do, first directive, right, Star Trek, we don't want to disturb um, if there happens to be life or the potential for life or resources or, you know, just being mindful of all of that in the process. I would love to be a fly on the wall in that room when they're discussing that. I think it's super cool. So lots going on with SpaceX and Starship and Starlink, but I just wanted to give you a quick update and run through that. And then finally, I just wanted to say that I'm very excited. I'm doing something for myself. I'm going to have fun and I'm going to New York Comic Con. It's the first time I've ever been able to go, and I'm also going to meet a whole bunch of the V friends that I've met online. We did an episode a few months back where I was talking about my resurgence into trading cards and how Gary V's V friends project gave a box of trading cards. If you were able to get one of the NFTs. I did, so I got this free box trading cards. Now they're having the TCG V Friends Championship in New York, and your boy got accepted. So I'm bringing a deck. We 3D printed a deck case, and we're going to be competing in that 50 person tournament. And I get to meet a bunch of people, V Friends, that I have been hanging out with online, chatting on streams, and just making friendships. 
I get to meet a lot of these people in person. So I'm super excited about that. I can't wait to compete in my first tournament and just go and experience a thing of culture like New York Comic Con is. Uh, we'll also be dressing up as one of the V Friends characters cosplay. It's October. So I've been in the 3D printing lab working on that. But that will be for another episode. This is Today in Space. Thank you for joining us for a space update. As always, I'm your Space Science Podcast host from the East Coast, Alex G. Orofanos, and we're closing this up. We hope you have a great end of your week. We'll see you next week for another interview for People of Science. Uh, very exciting stuff coming. I can't wait to share. We are just very happy that you're here. Thanks for joining us. Don't forget to tell your friends about the show. If they're also a space nerd or into space or just love tickling that brain. All right, this got weird. Let's end it. Have a good one. <laughs> See ya.